address two particular questions uh, to you. Well, the first question uh, would uh, uh, relate to what you described as a kind of discrepancy or sometimes uh, I would say even contradiction even between uh, the uh, former European approach to some of the neighborhood countries and the current one. And that would be the, uh, the uh, stability versus democracy. Uh, I think you rightly alluded to the fact that uh, in the past the European Union uh, often chose stability over democracy. Uh, and I think in North Africa we can see that most clearly, if we just remember it was not such a long time ago, uh, that, uh, for instance, President Sarkozy was, uh, you know, happy negotiating with Muammar Gaddafi and uh, making economic deals with him. Uh, but now we have the uh, European Neighborhood Policy Review, which was uh, published by uh, Lady Ashton and Commissioner Fila uh, in May, which seems, you know, to promote this concept uh, of deep democracy, and that seems to be the underlying principle uh, that we have in the European Neighborhood Policy Review. So I just would like to ask you, what, how would you see that this uh, Kind of different approach, or what we can perceive as a shift uh, of, a, of uh, in an approach of the European Union, can be or should be achieved in practical terms. What are the uh, steps that the European Union should do to support this uh, this deep democracy concept? And the second question, which perhaps in some ways will be also linked uh, to to my first question, would be. Uh, not surprisingly enough, on the European Endowment for Democracy. I know that you have personally been very much involved uh, in developing this concept. It's again something that we can find in the uh, European Neighborhood Policy Review. It is something that has been endorsed by the conclusions of the Foreign Affairs Council uh, in June. Uh, so if you can just brief us a bit on uh, what is the state of the debate uh, now uh, within the EAS, uh, within the member states, uh, on uh, the European Endowment of Demo for Democracy. And uh, if you can perhaps elaborate a bit more on how you see the relationship between this new instrument that will hopefully come into, into being soon uh, with the other instruments, uh, European instruments aimed at supporting democracy and human rights. Namely, I mean the European Instrument for Democracy and Human Rights, but also what we now have as the, or what will become the civil society facility uh, of the European neighborhood uh, instrument under the next multi-annual financial framework. So if you could just address these two questions for the beginning. Thank you. And as I understand, it's not the try to not allow our, our audience to ask any questions. <laughs> it, it is, of course, yeah. We we'll, we'll still have plenty of time. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, first of all, Yes, we, sh we see that especially in Euro European neighborhood policy, the issue of democracy uh, starts to be uh, really central. And my feeling is that this is with recognition that this is the issue of democracy, uh, of, of security. It means democracy in, neighbor in neighborhood is an issue of security. Traditionally, we were thinking about security counting time then we're thinking about security uh, dealing with uh, guarantee uh, that uh, none of the countries will not be uh, not will have limited access to energy sources or other economical issue that means the security was linked with the stable strong economy uh, today we are also understanding that for sure, first two are valid, but this third component, uh, that security means that you have reasonable neighbors where there is a democratic government. And we are talking about an, on two levels. The more basic level is, it never happened that it was the famine in democratic countries. The situation in Somalia and difference between Somalia and Kenya, Kenya is not extremely democratic country, but the political difference between this country shows us how it is important. In Somalia, people are dying from hunger. Few kilometers from there, in Kenya, people are just poor. And this is the difference. It's linked with the politics. It's not linked with the uh, 
circumstances that there is a different kind of people. No, it's the same, mainly the same people with the same skills, the same land, uh, but circumstances are more or less the same. Uh, so, uh, very important element is to ensure that in all the policies uh, we will think, especially in development cooperation, especially uh, signing economical uh, agreements with our partners uh, in the neighborhood, that we will think what we can do to empower people. And I'm not talking about liberal democracy. Uh, for sure, um, many people in the Northern Africa are looking in two directions. Uh, one, Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland. Another, uh, uh, Turkey. We see what in last decade that in Turkey uh, happened something very important. Uh, the first reaction. Uh, to uh, when today uh, government came to power was uh, it will be a disaster. Uh, it, it was the first reaction. We will see fundamentalism there. We will see a lot of difficulties. Mm, the reality is slightly different. Uh, the reality is that on different set of values uh, more or less reasonable political situation was developed, and we see the real economical and social development there, and we have more, not less peace uh, there. So it's important, it's important less. That means that in all mechanisms, especially um, in the huge package of uh, development cooperation, where democracy was never present, even if in Millennium Declaration, in opposite to Millennium Goals, there is a clear uh, the chapter uh, directly linked to democracy and human rights. <coughs> the next element is to balance more democracy and human rights. To this moment, um, in existing instruments, uh, the European Union was more concentrated on individual human rights, which for sure is extremely important. But being concentrated on individual human rights uh, and not changing the political context, the situation, um, you are operating rather on individual level than on the national level. Thinking about balance. Yesterday, Unfortunately, Alej Bielacki was sentenced, as you remember. Um, organizing the largest action to support Alej Bielacki, what we should do and what we are doing, will not change the situation in Belarus. We can make his situation better. We can improve the situation of his family, and we should do that. But for sure, this is not the solution for Belarus even if we will deliver the best support to those uh, human rights activities who are in need. Uh, so we should balance the uh, action linked with supporting uh, human rights activists and supporting democracy. And I see one important difference in wording. We usually, in Europe, we, we're saying Prom uh, promoting democracy. No. Uh, not promoting democracy. Supporting democracy. We would like to support democracy, not produce advertisements on democracy. Uh, this is a big diff difference. Uh, that means, and, and somehow it's linked with European Endowment for Democracy, <coughs> that we found, and this is recognition of more and more um, both politicians and, and countries, that somehow there is a gap in the tools we have. That we can support individuals in the sense of protecting human rights. Um, and we are more or less, 
or less more, prepared to cooperate with governments uh, which would like to uh, implement democracy. More or less, or less more, uh, for sure more in declarations, uh, less in practical actions, let's think about uh, Moldova. Uh, for sure the political message is clear, um, practical actions are not so advanced yet. So, uh, that, uh, that we are, and, and, and we have some tools to cooperate with these governments who are willing, especially if they can wait five years or seven years for the next multi-annual perspective, and then on the next multi-annual perspective we can plan something uh, if they will be ready to, 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 to wait enough uh, that we can join with our support. This is the reality. Until today, the European Instrument for Democracy and Human Rights did not use the reserve fund they had, uh, 3 million euro. Uh, it's not for the reason that the that people who are responsible did not found uh, Arab Spring uh, linked with democracy, or uh, that it's not urgent situation. There are some technical reasons uh, and some uh, that this money cannot be used. That's it. So, European Endowment for Democracy uh, was uh, suggested, was proposed by Minister Radosław Sikorski in late January, exactly in the context of Belarus and, and the Arab Spring. Um, we expect that the decision will be taken on the Foreign Affairs, uh, Foreign Affairs Council in the, on the December the 1st, and then we'll proceed uh, with, uh, with the uh, formal uh, establishing uh, endowment. What, what the concept is about and what we more or less have uh, consensus with our uh, with European External Action Service as well as uh, member states. First of all, it should support Democrats uh, and democratic institutions, not only in democratic states. That, that think about Tunisia two years ago. That means that we can support Democrats' <coughs> political movements without being partisan. Uh, we see the positive examples uh, and experiences of German <coughs> Stiftung in that. Supporting political actors doesn't mean supporting being too partisan. Um, and political actors, they, 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 they are specific in specific context. context. Please remember, in the Polish case, uh, this political actor uh, was called Solidarity. It was trade union. Okay? It was just developed uh, for this specific situation. In this specific situation, it was, uh, it was effective. Was it political party? No. Was that political actor? For sure. Then, uh, it should be a granting institution. That means that it should not operate in the directly uh, in these countries. Uh, also, operating without local offices, rather with traveling program offices than, than opening offices. Next, very important and quite difficult, to operate parallel to delegations. Uh, this is not possible to um, implement programs uh, for the traditional diplomatic channel, uh, we should get freedom to operate uh, parallel, of course, with information, but parallel to existing uh, uh, delegation of, of European Union. For sure, it should be joint activity. That means that this is not bilateral uh, activity, it should be recognized uh, and designed as a joint activity of 
European Union, its member states, <coughs> candidate states, EFTA states, as well as Switzerland. That, that, that means all the communities uh, we have in, um, in, 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 in Europe. Uh, then it should be based on the uh, matching funds from member states as well as uh, European Union and we found a way to use EU money for the granting. Uh, it was quite technically, technically uh, difficult. Light structure to take decision you know, rather on every month basis than every decade basis. Uh, the budget, Poland is absolutely sure that we can uh, spending 10 million uh, uh, euro in this year, just in this year, to support a uh, civil society in Belarus. We can afford for additional 5 million euro uh, to, <coughs> to support endowment. We believe that the first budget should be on the level of the 50 uh, million of, of euro, and this is something which we found realistic. Uh, so, um, the <coughs> important decisions will be taken uh, in on December the 1st, then we, we will cooperate with our uh, colleagues from TRIO uh, to, 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 complete, to complete the process. That's it. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Stanowski. Uh, I would like to open the floor for uh, the questions or comments uh, from the from the audience, so uh, okay, I can see one step on. And I, I suggest uh, if you're yeah fine with that, we'll take uh, maybe three questions in a row. So I think three three hands up. So uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Under Secretary. Thank you for your uh, deep presentations and uh, also answering the question, which David kind of a scholars from all of us uh, to ask a very interesting question, that's why it will not be so maybe interesting, but more on details. Uh, you said that payments are not influential. Then uh, can you put in this connection idea of uh, more and more adding funding, like as you just now mentioned, just only this year you're going to put five more millions for some activities if you're uh, not pretty sure that payments are influential. And what should be maybe really there as a components to go to make this influentiality? Because just simply putting into the conditions, sometimes uh, there's no mechanism to push or keep deadlines. And within this uh, component, as you just arrived from Africa, our springs was really in kind of an inspiring in many places. This change is possible. That is not only in America change is possible, but also in Africa change is possible. But actually what we see now or hearing from the news, after the changes, there's again clashes, people killed, arrested or something like this. What is the real situation there? What's going on? Is it just a simple transition of class or real changes taking place? I would truly appreciate your comments. So if I can just ask, if I can just ask you to identify yourselves also when I pose the question, yeah. Thank you. Yes, Mr. And the Secretary, thank you very much for your presentation. My name is Katarina Zarembo. I am Deputy Director of the Institute of World Policy, a think tank in Ukraine. So I cannot but take this opportunity and ask the question, which is very pending for Ukraine right now. As you are all very well aware, the initialing of the agreement, be it on the summit, the EU-Ukraine summit in December, or before or after or during, may not take place soon, meaning in December. So this is a personal, um, personal mission, uh, which as we see it from Ukraine and Poland, personal mission of Mr. Sikorsky. Uh, a lot of input was done by President Komorowski himself. What is Polish plan B, if initialing doesn't take place right now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> um, 
Uh, we're talking about democracy in the countries which are not yet in the European Union but want to be there. We are talking about the Eastern Partnership and we'll be talking more and more. But I, I'm afraid we are not going to talk about one player who absolutely is the, the only one who knows what they want. And we recently heard uh, the, the statement of the ambassador of Russia, Rogozin, who uh, on, uh, answered the journalists uh, asking him what his main achievement was during five years. He said, oh, you asked me that question. Ukraine is not in, the, in NATO. And uh, that's probably means something. And next year we are having, I mean, we all are having uh, elections in Russia, probably. There will be one big achievement there. Ukraine is not in European Union. So there is something that, um, that is not only what we haven't done, because we are so stupid, because we are so inefficient, because we are so ineffective, and we are not ambitious, and everything which is negative. And probably there's not only what you are doing, but there's something else which, if is not analyzed, is not taken into consideration, and is not simply worked with, then we are uh, blind, uh, or it's all blind, blind work. Thank you. Maybe if you'd like to respond to Mr. Stanowski now, then we can take another round of questions. Thank you very much. The issue of effectiveness is obviously the crucial, not just in politics, first of all in business. When we are thinking about amounts, please remember mainly the support for the solidarity movement was one million US dollars. Not so much. Yeah. That is when we are comparing that to the money today EU is spending. So this is the issue uh, how to find the best way to invest the money. And more and more often we should think what is possible. It should be just wishful thinking. Think, looking at, at, at Africa, we have totally, three totally different situations in in Tunisia, Egypt, uh, and uh, and Libya, and at this mo at this stage, I'm not talking about Yemen, Syria. Um, are we better prepared for Syria than for Tunisia? I don't know. It's not so sure. Uh, and we, like in other places, same happened in some countries of today, is to partnership. They are some windows of opportunities. And these three countries which are with, with totally different political situation, social situation, uh, try to use their opportunities. Same fact, I'm very optimistic uh, after the elections in, in Tunisia. I believe that this result of the elections is bringing people um, to, to the table and, and force them to discuss what can be changed. Traveling with Lech Wałęsa to Tunisia, there were two ways they looking at, at him. First of all, that he is a person value-based. It means that he was not ready to give some call it traditional, no, just the values, uh, to, 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 to join democracy, to join struggle for freedom. At the same moment, the another way they were looking at him, and it's, it's, it's extremely important in Africa. Who is the Lord? Lord? Son of general? No. He's a citizen. That probably means that citizens can influence the future of the country. Unbelievable. In Africa, quite often. So for them, these two aspects are uh, extremely, extremely important. The situation in Northern Africa <coughs> will depend both on from us, but first of all, they should decide. Uh, 
And we cannot do that on, 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 on behalf of that. Uh, we cannot just impose our way of thinking. But on the other hand, uh, Poland did several activities, with, with, especially with Tunisia. Uh, uh, during Polish elections, they were observers from Egypt, from Libya, and from uh, Tunisia. Uh, there are several activities in these countries, first of all in Tunisia, as well um, as experts, uh, ministers who are visiting Poland to learn uh, what kind of questions they have to answer. They will not get answers from us. We will, we will can show them what, uh, what, question, what questions are crucial for, for, for the success. Plan B for Ukraine. I'm very sorry, this is part of the uh, foreign policy of Poland. Um, believe me, plan A, plan B, plan C, uh, but plan <coughs> A is to build best neighborhood and understanding with the Ukrainian nation, society, uh, and to do Everything is possible to encourage this society to take decisions about themselves. Uh, this is what we can do as a fair, fair neighbors. And this is something what's most, uh, most important in that. We, um, both Ukrainians and Poles, found a way not to be slaves of the history. In this part of the world, there were two ways to become national heroes. To kill the neighbors, or to, to be killed by neighbors. And we escaped from that. We found that there are different ways to, uh, that it can be a different future for our children. And this is most important in our relationship with Ukraine. And I believe that we succeed with that. On the other hand, it's independent state. Uh, and we treat sovereignty of, of Ukraine very seriously, uh, both on the national level and on the community level. Uh, who, otherwise, it wouldn't be fair. Um, is Russia uh, the only ones, which only the only country which know what they want? I don't think so. Poland is such a country. <laughs> Maybe we know what we want. Looking for the last 25 years, we accomplished something. In the sense that we quit one club, we joined another club, uh, we did it voluntarily. Uh, and saying frankly, I just been in Birma. Uh, elections in Birma and Poland were very close to each other. In 1989, we won in 35%, and they won in 80%. Today, Poland is uh, the presidency in the Council of European Union. Birma is uh, uh, counting all the time political, uh, political prisoners, unfortunately. They are after, after some visits, some, some amnesties. But we are totally in different, different way. This is showing the scale. This, this is the scale of that which could happen. Oh, Once again? I meant only for a policy and Eastern partnership in that part, and all those democratizing. I meant only those democratizing countries and the uh, plans towards them, and not the, the, the successes, of course, definite successes for the second countries. Mm. Two elements. I used to work with Ukrainian, Belarusian partners, Georgian partners, since 1991. And I see a lot of differences. I see what happened in this period. We see both some advantages and some disadvantages. We see in the region many lost chances. And this is for sure. We also see that um, if 
the leadership is really very strongly willing and with support of the nation to, to implement the change, it is possible. Uh, just one fact. Georgia today became to export energy. Georgia is starting to sell energy abroad. We remember the moment when uh, the situation in Georgia physically depending uh, uh, to, uh, to the pipe from Russia. That means that something is possible. But of course, uh, we should uh, have the political will and we should work hard on that. If, I, if you would ask me how it happened that in Poland we succeed, two elements were crucial. On one side, of course, Balcerowicz with his economical reform. But on the other hand, uh, Professor Regulski with the reform of the local government. That means that we decentralized power, in our case, again, and that we empowered local communities. Today, the highest quality of education is in the poorest area of the country. Why? Through selling oil, gold? No to empowering people uh, who are taking care about education of the, the of the children. This is how it happened. And for sure, it can happen in different way in any of the countries we are talking about. Okay, we have time for one more round of questions. So, okay, can see one hand there. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Clara Weger from the European Partnership for Democracy in Brussels. Uh, I would like to get back shortly on the European Endowment for Democracy. And I have a very simple question. Um, if Mr. Minister could tell us a bit about what is being done for it not to become another uh, bureaucratic institution of the European Union. Because I think the most added value of such an institution would be that it provides flexible funding, that is accessible to small organizations in the neighborhoods, and uh, that is different from, from the EIDHR and the state actors we all know here. Uh, so I would like you uh, to, to tell us a bit about flexibility. Is it still on the agenda? Is it being discussed? Uh, and what is being done? Thank you. Okay, there's one more question here. Uh, Olga Sturzynska, head of the Office for Democratic Values in Brussels. Uh, Minister, you touched upon uh, the Poland's efforts to improve the situation in Belarus. And I have a very particular question here. Uh, there was one offer to the Belarusian government, this famous Vestavele Sikorsky offer before the presidential elections 2010. And then there was a recent offer to the government of Belarus by Prime Minister Tusk, what Belarus could get in case it's embarks on the path of democratic change. Uh, were those two offers coordinated with the other member states of the uh, European Union? And also the same can be said about the visit of uh, the Bulgarian um, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mladenov, to Belarus, which basically shows the lack of coordination and what, in your view, can be done to improve this? Thank you. Okay. If there are no more questions, I will just ask Mr. Stanowski to, to respond to those. It's not worth to establish European endowment for democracy uh, if it not will be uh, flexible. And I'm saying that openly. Uh, we are not interested in that. And Poland will be the first country to be against uh, if it will not allow. Uh, to, to operate in the communities which, where today we couldn't operate so easily, if it will bring results like that what happened with Belarus, where the special grant line was opened just for NGOs registered in Belarus. And it happened, as we remember, in April, if I remember properly, this year. Um, then we are not interested. And what's, in, in, what's important, um, in last 
uh, two weeks, I spent quite a lot of time talking with the parliamentarians uh, from uh, different political groups as well as different countries. Um, and they also see that there is a clear need and this issue of flexibility is crucial, otherwise we have instruments which, 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 which exist and um, how they see and we agree uh, that there is no overlapping with existing instruments. Uh, European Endowment will be the first to be in the field, especially in difficult uh, circumstances, to operate, but also to, to quit, to pass um, the leading to the existing instrument. Uh, after all, when the situation will be more stable, when it will be possible to uh, uh, to plan in advance. That means that in a year, in two years from now, in Tunisia, with a constitution, new, uh, more or less stable government, more or less stable economy, it will be for sure time not to be so involved on behalf of such of instruments like um, not existing to the uh, European Endowment for Democracy, but rather to use these tools uh, which, are, uh, which are active. Saying frankly, the main problem today is about money. Well, guys, uh, this is not easy to give additional promises. Uh, uh, on the other hand, we see that there is a will and there is a number of states which for sure would like to uh, would like to do uh, other will uh, will be uh, observing of the, on the first stage on the other hand Australia is asking can we join the answer is unfortunately no but probably we can find a way uh, to, 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 to cooperate better I would say that visit of Minister Sikorsky and Mr. Vela before the election was very, very important. It was very important, it was not just the visit of uh, Minister Sikorsky, uh, Foreign Minister of, of Poland, but that this visit was rather in the broader context. Was it the formal visit of the EU? No, uh, in the sense that it was not agreed with according to all the procedures we have in the EU to be represented jointly. But on the other hand, it showed a clear message from the EU. And when this message was not accepted, the a solidarity to support a civil society and to pass the message to the uh, Belarusian government with the sanctions, with the visa ban uh, for those who are responsible um, was created on behalf of the European Union. The last uh, proposal of Prime Minister Tusk is not for today government of Belarus. It's the message both towards Belarus and European member states, <coughs> European Union as a whole. If the political prisoners will be released, uh, if then we should start start to talk seriously. If will have fair elections with transparent results uh, according to the international observers in Belarus. They will be very seriously treated uh, also in the sense of economical cooperation. But once again, this is not just offer for existing government. Um, first, uh, amnesty and political rehabilitation, then talks, then round table, 
then elections, and then signing checks. No pay without the elections in Belarus. And this is also creating the mm, position of all the European member states and European Union towards Belarus. Poland uh, took the position of, of, of the leader in creation of this policy. And we expect, expect from the leader uh, to, to propose proposals, to, to, to propose what kind of policy uh, we, should, uh, we should take in this situation a year later. And this is what, uh, what, how we should understand um, the proposal of uh, Prime Minister Tusk. And it was proposal uh, not presented on the uh, foreign visit in Minsk to uh, President Lukashenko. No. This proposal was submitted to all the European community to be better prepared than we used to be prepared for Tunisia. Let's imagine that we have democratic elections in Belarus. Should we be prepared? Yes, we believe that we should. Uh, should we start to think about that? Uh, about this plan A, B, C? For Belarus, at the moment when we see that the elections were fair? No. We should think about that today, and Poland uh, is taking a lead to, 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 to talk about that with the uh, European colleagues, and in the same way we should behave when we are talking about the southern neighborhood, about situation in Syria, situation in Yemen. We should be prepared for more than one option uh, what can happen uh, in this uh, in this region. And saying frankly, uh, we believe in Poland, uh, we believe in Polish mini Minister of Foreign Affairs, that we have more than three options uh, when we're dealing with, with our neighbors. The first is to finance them, the second is to freeze the assets, and the third is to bomb them. <laughs> we believe that in the foreign policy we are more options. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Stanowski, for your um, thought-provoking speech uh, and uh, for answering all the questions from the audience. Uh, I would like to thank you again personally on my behalf and on behalf of Pesos and the organizers for uh, joining us here today. And uh, well, I wish you all the uh, good luck in, in your work for the rest of the Polish presidency, but also, also for the future. And I would like to ask the audience uh, to join me again in thanking you uh, for being with us today. Thank you very much.